music. And you won't find him down on sunset or at a party in the hills at the bottom of the bottle or when you're tripping on some pills. When the soul you the dream, you were just 16, packed a bag and ran away. And it's a crying shame you came all this way because you won't find Jesus in LA. And it's a crying shame you came all this way because you won't find Jesus in LA. The Cure with Amy Cabo. Life can bring many difficult situations, domestic violence, addictions, poverty, and even sexual abuse by your loved ones. Welcome, Amy Cabo and The Cure. Good afternoon and welcome to The Cure. I'm your host, Amy Cabo, always joined by Boris. Some things never change. And that's me. Hello. Our show is available live on your radio through our app called The Cure on our website, God is the Cure. And we are also broadcasting live on Facebook. Search for God is the Cure. Please click on send a message button and then you can send us a question or a comment. We would love to hear from you. This show deals with suffering and the tenacity of the human spirit, the will to survive and the courage to keep moving forward despite any obstacle with the help of God and each other. We do provide testimonies to let people know that they're not alone. And in this show, the testimony started with me, having been a survivor from child abuse and in well into young adulthood. We also have professionals in the medical field and inspirational speakers that are willing to help and can give valuable information because education is key Transparency is needed, and I believe we can be there for each other. For me, my healing came from God, but other forms of healing are presented as well to service everyone. As it is, life can be very challenging, but I always know that we're not alone. We will not find God in the wrong places, or in the wrong company, or when self-medicating. We may have packed our bags and ran away, and it's a crying shame if we came all this way because we will not find Jesus in L.A. And basically, it means that sometimes we look for happiness in the wrong places, with the wrong people, or in doing the wrong things, sacrificing our beliefs and al allowing our faith to fade away. Sometimes we believe we don't have a choice, but always we always do even when it seems impossible. So today we will be discussing relentless triumphs over unbelievable trials. And our special guest is Chelly Wolford. Chelly is the founder of Bloom, the first co-working space for women in Las Vegas. She has thrived in a male-dominated industry, including the wireless industry and music entertainment management business where she continues to play a strategic role in international superstar Pitbull's brand partnership and organizational strategy. Her success did not come without hardship. Shelly experienced extreme sexual abuse at a young age at the hands of a family member and then again while a student at the U.S. Naval Academy. Never one to let obstacles deter her from her vision for success, she persevered and ultimately became one of the most successful women in business. Her latest project, Bloom, is Las Vegas' first and only co-working space specifically created for women. She has created a culture at Bloom that is a safe and creative space where women can embrace freedom of expression, pursue their professional passion, and collaborate with other inspirational women. Shelly, thank you for being on the show. We are now live on The Cure. Wonderful, thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Shelly, I've never heard of Bloom. This is something that's very new to me. And I, I know that it's in Las Vegas. And by saying that you're one of the first women for the co-working space, what exactly is that? Can you tell us a little bit more about it and how it came about? I can. Uh, 
Bloom was born from, you know, necessity as the mother of invention. I had moved back to Las Vegas, and I was doing strategic consulting, and I was working out of my kitchen on my, you know, my kitchen bar. And it would be a 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I would look around and go, okay, have I talked to anyone in real life today? I, you know, only see my neighbors when I walk my dog. And I was just feeling really disconnected from community. Um, so I wanted a space to work, and I was looking at co-working is, is pretty popular now um, with the, like, giants like WeWork and um, the Riveter and other co-working spaces. So I looked in Las Vegas um, to see what co-working spaces existed, and there just wasn't anything that was what I wanted which was a beautiful place to go, so something, something I looked forward to going to. And this chapter of my life, I just wanted to be surrounded by women. And I spent most of my life surrounded by men in the military, corporate and world, music industry. And you know, this chapter of my life, I really specifically just wanted to harness and um, when you say, women and And when you say co-working, what do you mean by co-working space? So for, for it, for example, you are an entrepreneur starting a business okay. and can't afford a lease in an office yet, but don't want to work from your home, you could come to Bloom and for a monthly membership fee, use Bloom as your office. Oh. So um, it's, yeah, so it, it's just a, it's an easier way for women who are starting businesses to have a professional workspace. We have, you know, conference rooms. We have everything you would find in a traditional office without the, what I like to say, the soul-sucking of fluorescent lights or cubicles. Like, it's a beautiful space. So, um, so I have members that are real estate agents or that have, are just starting their own businesses that work remotely for large corporations that, again, just are tired of being at home and we're missing the community. So a place where they can work together, especially if they're starting out. You're basically a pioneer for the advancement of women's career. That's amazing. Thank you. No, it's, it's again, it was something that I was looking for. And so I found, you know, I, I decided to, I looked around. There wasn't anything that was um, interesting to me. And I, it was something that I talked about for two years. Like, I'm thinking about doing this. I want to open this space. You know, my market research were all my girlfriends. And they're like, Shelly, you should do this. This is a great idea. It's a great idea. So two years, it's almost two years that I've opened um, next month and 60-plus members. And it's a, an amazing community of women. And magic happens there every day. It's, the, it's women that help each other, that support each other in their businesses. Um, they collaborate. It's like a mastermind, you know, you, you find solutions. I think it's easier for us women to solve other people's problems than our own. That's amazing so, because know, um, more, um, more minds working together, even better. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And probably being that it's, it's all women, it's easy to understand one another, I guess. <laughs> it really is. It's just different energy. And it's funny, when I first opened, I had a few men just like why all women you know why not men <laughs> I'm, like, Listen. I'm like bloom is not against men we're for women and there's a difference and the energy is different and men are allowed to come in for meetings they just can't be members right. um, and That's we really okay. haven't had a problem with that and I've also said like okay guys <laughs> you have the rest of the world can I have the 3,000 square feet please <laughs> yeah. That's so funny <laughs> okay so now I'm gonna talk sorry Hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so for for women, that's super cool. Is that the, do you know if that exists for men only? Is there co-working spaces for men? He wants to know. <laughs> I think when they first opened, they were primarily men. Oh really? Um, oh. Well, where have we been? I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, do you think about country clubs? Like you think about all the things that have existed that were just for men from oh. a very long time. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> so, I don't think we suffer yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. I see. I'm, I'm getting it now. <laughs> but, I mean, Shelly, tell me a little bit about how, because you've overcome so much. You are an amazing woman. I know that you came from a small town in Ohio. And not only that, but you were abandoned by your mother at birth. And uh, um, Yeah, not at birth, about 18 months in. So I was... 
I was born in Miami to a Cuban mom and my dad, who's from Ohio. So I like to say I'm half Cuban and a half redneck, because <laughs> that's 100% true. Um, I like it. And so when I was about 18 months old, my mom, so I think, I think where it went terribly wrong is when my dad moved my Cuban mother and me and my sister from Miami to the Newark, Ohio, which is a very small town and kind of backwards, and probably definitely at that time, for sure there was rage, racial tension. Um, so my mom felt very uncomfortable, and she was, you know, 23, 24 years old with two little girls, and my older sister is not my dad's daughter. So there was complications. Um, so she one day was just you know, wanted to move back to my, Miami. Her and my dad were splitting up, and she called my grandparents, my dad's parents, and said, I'm moving back to Miami. I'm taking, you know, Jenny, my oldest sister. Um, do you want Shelly? And at the time, my grandparents were like, of course. Like, what are you going to do with her? <laughs> I go, okay, yes, we'll take her. So that was the beginning of um, being raised by my grandparents until I was five. And I, and I definitely want to go more into that because I, I want to show – uh, our listeners or at least let them know that it doesn't matter how difficult life starts out that you can still be successful and make an imprint in life make a difference for others i'm yeah. amy cabo and, and this is the cure heart. we will continue talking to shelly after the short break please stay with us right back with Amy Cabell and The Cure. Life can bring many difficult situations. Domestic violence, addictions, poverty, and even sexual abuse by your loved ones. The issue is not stay there, but to overcome all obstacles and show that with the love of God, your husband, and your family, you can succeed. Love is the answer, God is the cure, reveals Amy Cabo's life, a warrior who didn't give up and achieved the dream of her life. You can get to know more about her and her story on GodIsTheCure.com or buying her book on Amazon.com. Never let your feelings sit in judgment over your faith. Dr. Tony Evans says no matter what your emotions are telling you, the Lord is still in control. I don't care what crisis you are now going through, you're not the first one God has had to address. It's a look at the upside of down times, focusing on how God gets his people to reach out for revival. This week on The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans. The eloquent words of some of our old hymns manage to add beauty to the darkest days of life. Hello, I'm Chuck Swindoll. Here's an example. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. What beautiful words. You and I might never have thought to describe a difficult period like that. But others before us have suffered, remember, and they've left behind these wonderful words to encourage us to hold on to hope, to press forward, to trust in our God. Pastor and teacher Chuck Swindoll. Visit Insight for Living's website at insight.org. Maybe I'm just making up, making a big deal over nothing, yeah. over nothing. Maybe I'm paranoid, got these thoughts yeah, in my head yeah, that I can't avoid. No. I was looking at you the other day, the other day. Yeah, you used to look in my eyes, now you look away. Oh, I was looking at you the other day. And now we will continue with Amy Cabo and The Cure. Welcome back to the show. For those that are just tuning in, I'm Amy Cabo and this is The Cure. And we're talking to Shelley Wolford about radical triumphs over unimaginable trials. We are live on your radio, also on Facebook. And later the show will be available as a podcast. Just search for The Cure on iTunes. 
Sometimes we do make a big deal over nothing. It's all about the way we look at it, and we can be paranoid. These fruitless thoughts can also be considered worrying. Others call it stress. It can be jealousy or suspicion, but they all get us nowhere. We just self-sabotage. And I think Stephen Puth outlines it when he says, she looks to look in my eyes and now she looks away but it's always a very nice humble song because he gets it and getting it is how he it's the first step in solving it shelly we were talking about last about you having been abandoned by your mother which i'm really sorry to hear that that must have been very hard for you but you had grandparents right that raised you and I know, I, I understand that at one point you had experienced unspeakable sexual abuse, first from a family member and then at the Naval Academy. How were you able to find the strength to forgive them and overcome it? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think years and years of just doing the work to heal my wounds and understanding that hurt people hurt people. And also, I think what I like to say now is healed people heal people. <laughs> so um, I, from my family member, it was an uncle that molested me, but he was a teenager at the time. But for years, I demonized him and obviously was very angry and very upset. And, and I know you know what it feels like to be sexualized at such a young age because I, I think that was my very first memory on this planet is being molested by my uncle when I was three. So, wow. um, so for years I was very angry about it and feeling broken and like, <laughs> like, it, like I didn't know where to go in, in my life, like that this thing happened to me and that was always going to be my story. Um, and then when it happened again, my first year, so, you know, I, I grew up in a small town in Ohio. I was adopted by my aunt when I was seven. So um, my grandparents, my grandmother died when I was five. So I had, my, my childhood was very chaotic. I moved around a lot until I got a little bit settled with my aunt. Um, but you then know, Shelly, I, I just want to go back work. to where you said hurt people, hurt people. And I've been doing a lot of research and when it comes to teenagers and younger people because my brother tried something and I think a cousin may have when I was younger too besides my stepfather mm -hmm. but there's also another uh, another thing that uh, there's specialist that deals with that that she has researched in her 30 years of investigating when it comes to young people they get addicted to pornography and uh, yeah I mean so it, it, what I about five years ago because I've been writing about it on like, writing as part of my therapy so for years I've been writing about what happened to me and how I came o overcame it and my uncle sent me a message on Facebook about five years ago and a, like owned all of it he told me that he had also been molested as a child, which that obviously that happens a lot. So he had yes. male cousins that had done unspeakable things to him. Wow. And um, he was just like, I'm so sorry. I'm, you know, I, this happened to me. I'm so sorry I did it to you. You can do whatever you want with this information. Meaning, you know, if I wanted to take it to the cops or something, but it was, it was the most healing email of my life. Because That's really nice. I saw him as not a demon, but actually a teenage boy who had also been violated in terrible ways. A person and that needed help themselves. What? He was he's someone that needed help himself. Yes, exactly. That's what I, I that was my response back to him. I'm like, geez, like there was just nobody watching over us <laughs> back then. <laughs> like all these things were happening, and like where were the adults in our lives? Um, but you know, we grew up kind of feral. So, yeah, he needed help as well. And I, it, I have so much respect for the fact that he was able to send me something like that, like to put it in writing, and just come clean. And it was that's it amazing. Was immediately healing. 
That's amazing that everybody gets that. <laughs> that that's yeah. Really... Oh my God! You imagine? Yeah. No. Yeah, it's it usually. Was... I don't. I don't believe it's what usually happens. So, that really is no. amazing that they can realize that it's something that they need to help themselves about and something that they need to fix or something that they need to take care of. Otherwise, if yeah. they think it's okay, it just continues. Yeah. And he's a good man. He's obviously, we're, all, we're both much older now, and he's a good person. He's married, grandchildren. You know, he's, he's a good guy. So he, the, the beauty of what happened to both of us is that we both broke the cycle of dysfunction, the legacy that was that side of our family. Well, where and that just comes to show there's check, second chances even for him. Even someone yeah. like that, God can forgive and can be a good person because we don't know what's the motivation or the or what's 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 behind what's the source behind the action yeah absolutely i believe that all of us in our pure you know our our source energy our pure potential we are born pretty perfect and beautiful and then life happens to us <laughs> and some of us get That's you know really... some like tougher lemons than others that's a great and it, way it to really put it. Is what you do with it? Yeah, it's 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 a choice you make. It it's is. A, it's Absolutely. a choice you make. I mean, people people don't realize it, and a lot of times we lie to ourselves, and it's it's really the enemy making us believe that we don't have a choice, that there's only the way that's the wrong way, and that it's impossible mm -hmm. because it seems too difficult to do it the right way. That happens a lot to most of us but you know knowing is important once you know you can fix it <laughs> yeah. you can pray that's how I fix it yeah absolutely I think what I heard in your what you were saying like there's different different modalities I think prayer is important I think meditation is important I think it I think it's really important to do self-analysis and understand like your darkness like we all have dark sides and that's okay and if you embrace the darkness then you can really get to the light you know it's 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 not about in my opinion it's not about and know, even denying that and we even, all have these sides it's about embracing it and going where does that really come from like the if it's neediness or need for attention or you know whatever it is it's some wound that has happened. And, and even if you, you don't understand it, it because you don't know the, 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 what's the source behind the guy at the Naval Academy raping you, even if you don't understand it, you can still go forward. You can still move forward and forgive the person. Because after all, it's not up to me. That's, that's for, judge, for God to take care of, for God to judge, not for us. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's also important, uh, I, I haven't experienced anything bad, but it, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, but also I think it's important for people that have gone through, through things like that to report them and to go forward because this is protecting the next one. Oh, definitely. It is important. That's it's what these shows are for. Shelly, stay with us. I'm Amy Cabo, and this is The Cure. We will continue to talk to Shelly after the short break. Please stay with us. We will be right back with Amy Cabo and The Cure. Now, I'm at three with... No, this is going to be... Hey. Hi, I'm Johnny Erickson Tata, and the Bible tells us to worship God with all our heart and soul and strength. Now, right there, God is telling us to worship Him with everything we've got, everything that's in us. But what does that mean? How do we know we're worshiping the Lord as we should? Well, listen to these words from William Temple, a Christian statesman from the last century. He says, Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by His holiness. Worship is the renewal of our mind by His word. Worship is the purifying of our imagination by His beauty, the opening of the heart to His love. Worship is the surrender of will to His purpose. All these things gathered up 
and adoration of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, adoration is the most selfless emotion of which your nature is capable. That's a great definition for worship. Life can bring many difficult situations. Domestic violence, addictions, poverty, and even sexual abuse by your loved ones. The issue is not stay there, but to overcome all obstacles and show that with the love of God, your husband, and your family, you can succeed. Love is the answer, God is the cure, reveals Amy Cabo's life. A warrior who didn't give up and achieved the dream of her life. You can get to know more about her and her story on GodIsTheCure.com or buying her book on Amazon.com. Next time on Focus on the Family, Dr. Tony Evans explains what it means to have a kingdom marriage under God's authority and for His glory. He shares about maintaining oneness, the importance of having a servant's heart, and how to rebuild a marriage relationship that's been fractured. God's wisdom for your marriage on the next Focus on the Family. continue with Amy Cabo and The Cure. We're back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Cabo and you're listening to The Cure live every Friday at 1 p.m. on your radio on our app The Cure live on Facebook. Just search for God is a Cure. You can send us a message or ask us a question by clicking send message. It's nice to know that my kind will be on my side. That is God and all his people and creation. It's a comforting feeling. And I have learned not to believe the hype, not the lies told by others or the lies I tell myself. And even if I feel a terrible sight, I know I'll be just fine. Guys, just don't believe the hype. We are continuing our conversation with Shelley about the power of the human spirit. Shelley, last when we were talking, I, I, I started off, Shelley, that we were talking about, and, and give me a second because I'm just getting back to it. And, um, okay, so we were talking about that even no matter what life throws at you, no matter what we've, we get in life, we can still move forward and we can still overcome things. And so I wanted to ask you, Shelley, one of the favorite questions that Oprah asks is, what do you know for sure? So I ask you, Shelley, what do you know for sure? I love that question and I love Oprah. Um, what I know for sure is the world is better if we all love ourselves and always come from a place of love. Um, decisions made from a place of love. But I really, I really think it's deeply, deeply important to, and it's a cliche, but I think it's a cliche because it's true, but you really need to learn to love yourself and all parts of yourself and love the obstacles that you went through, love the, you know, terrible, the trauma, love all of it. And um, when you, we have, like, radical self-acceptance, then, then beautiful things can occur and bloom from there. Absolutely. That is so important because if you really, if, if you really think about it, who's going to do a better job for you than yourself? Who's going to yeah. care more about it than yourself? And you're supposed to be your own best friend but you've you've really gotten far in life and you've had a very interesting life Shelley let's say for example Pitbull is one of the most innovative entrepreneurially successful music artists in the entertainment world so tell me 
What was working for him in a strategic role been like for you? Can I just say that I love Pitbull? <laughs> <laughs> I will tell him you said that. Um, working with him has been maybe one of the greatest blessings of my life. And I will tell you, when he asked me to work with him, I thought, you know, as the older, more experienced, you know, military background, corporate world background, startup background, that I was going to be bringing just so much wisdom to him. And I did. <laughs> However, I had no idea how much he would bring to me. And the nice. thing that people don't realize about him, and his real name's Armando, is that he's, he's so deeply wise. He is a visionary, and all of his you know, he's, he's about positivity and living in the moment and, you know, don't stop the party, <laughs> we may not have tomorrow. Like, mm -hmm. these are lyrics in his songs, but they're really how he lives his life. And he's been through, insane, like, in, he had an insane childhood. Um, wow. And you would never know it to meet him. Like, he's, he has turned all of the positive, or all the negative to positive. He's, you know, turned all the pain into purpose. Nice. And um, it's it's just really inspiring to work with him. It, it made me up my game, and I will say, having come from growing growing up in Ohio was, and you know, God bless my Ohio family. They saved my life, <laughs> and I love them very much. <laughs> but it was a it was a negative. It, it was more of a negative culture, in that like you work hard. Then you retire, and then you probably die, and like pay taxes. You like it's like work to live instead of, you know, live to work. And it's, so it's a very negative kind of culture. And I didn't realize how much of that I had seeped into my oh, own. You sure know how to culture. give a positive twist to negative things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so but working with him, I've really, like, looked at my own beliefs that, I'm like, are these really my beliefs? Like, do I believe that you have to, you know, like you just stay in one job? And I mean, obviously I don't because I have my own business. <laughs> but like, I, I just looked at things that I saw growing up around me. And I'll, I take the good, which is incredible work ethic, kindest people, um, you know, very loving. Like, they, you know, but I let go of the things that weren't working for me which were this kind of there's not enough, like the scarcity mentality um, that I just don't believe. So don't believe the so hype. Armando Pitbull is very, there's plenty for all of us. We bring everybody up together. Nice. You know, you don't leave anyone behind. Excellent. And it's, you know, all of us doing it. It's, if you talk to him, he would say it's us, it's we. I'm so grateful. We've all done this. He never, ever takes credit just by himself ever. I've never heard him do that. It's Amazing. always all of us. And it seems like he's yeah. had his own set of challenges, whatever came to him in his world. Yeah, he had some pretty intense challenges. He grew up with out parents as well and in foster care for a short period of time. And then wow. um, his mom was like in and out of his life. And yeah, he's, he's had a very, he had a very difficult upbringing. But yeah, and, and I've seen that in some of the, some of the artists, some of the more, uh, you know, unique, special people in the entertainment system have had challenges. It's almost as if it helps you grow. It makes you into a for sure, bigger, yeah. better person or something. I, I think would love so. to invite them in the show. In, yeah, I think it inspires creativity. And when you start with, you know, having had all those challenges and overcome them, something he says to me all the time, which I, like, if I'm starting to stress out about something, he's like, Mama, don't worry about it. It's all kindergarten at this point. And it's true. It's I like, love once it. you've gone through so many things, right? Like, it's all easy after that. Nice. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure what, what could be some of the prejudice or typecasts you've had to overcome along the way just to reach you, your personal, your professionally and, per, and personally today? I mean, what have you had, what have been maybe difficulties for you? Um, I think at the academy it was being one of the only women. <laughs> there was very few of us. 
um, in the corporate world, being one of the only women, and then I was very young for the positions that I was in. I was, my counterparts were white men that were at least 15 years older than me. Um, but you know what? I always use that to my advantage because people always remember the one woman in the room. <laughs> and, <laughs> you kind of stand And out. I love being <laughs> underestimated. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Love so <laughs> I, was, I just used it as uh, opportunities to grow and um, you know, just I just focused on my lane and continued to be the best doing what I was doing. And, and, and especially as you get older, you know, I'm 46 now, I really don't care what other people think. <laughs> and that serves me quite well. You know, I love, I, it's important to me, I want to inspire, I want to work hard, I want to create beautiful things. I want, with Bloom, I want to expand it. I want to help other, empower other women to start their businesses or do their scary, you know, risk-taking things. Um, but whether there are people out there going, she doesn't know what she's doing, she's, you know, whatever, I just don't care. I really don't. And that's the beauty of having it happen for so many years. <laughs> I say that with, like, a bad relationship as well. Like, the beauty of a bad relationship is that you learn to love yourself for real. You get to appreciate yourself more. (laughs) That's a great way to look at it. I love it. I I, I truly love it. But, Shelly, didn't you have a brother or a sister from birth somewhere out there? Yeah, I have... um, I'm the only child of my mom and dad, but okay. through my mom, I have a brother and sister, a half-brother, half-sister, and then through my dad, I have a half-sister. And then my aunt adopted me when I was seven, so I grew up with her kids, my cousins that I, are my sisters and brother. So and how it's did you weird. Find I'm an only about... child technically, but I have lots of siblings. How did you find out you had siblings? I of which one knew. is Pitbull? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I always knew, like, I knew that I was adopted. I knew I had um, a mom who was Cuban and a sister. And then the very first time I ever heard my mother's voice, she called me on my 12th birthday and told me that I had a little brother oh. who was two, named Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, uh, so I had Jenny and Mandy, and then... You know, years go by. She said she was going to keep in touch, but that didn't quite happen. And then after I graduated high school and was getting ready to go to the Naval Academy, I went to Miami for the very first time and met my mom. Okay, we'll get back to this. Shelly, we're going into break. I'll get back to you. When we're back, we'll continue talking with Shelly about being strong despite difficult circumstances and finding one's purpose. I'm Amy Cabo, and this is The Cure. We'll be right back with Amy Cavill and The Cure. Hey, this is Bob Olszewski. Thanks for listening to Plugged In. I am attempting to stop an uncontrolled antimatter reaction, which threatens our entire solar system. The deep space thriller Ad Astor follows a seasoned astronaut named Roy McBride. Roy must uncover the truth about his father's expedition from 30 years before that might be currently threatening the universe. Ad Astra aims for the same thoughtful orbit as other recent sci-fi space films. As such, it deals in brave choices and pulse-quickening action. But audiences must navigate moments of bloody violence that push that action closer to horror movie levels. And that nudges Ad Astra down to a rating of 2 out of 5 for family friendliness. Read the full review at PluggedIn.com slash radio. Plugging you into the movies, I'm Bob Walaszewski for Focus on the Family's Plugged In Movie Review. And sometimes they need, no matter what they've done wrong, whether it's lying or defying or or whatever, sometimes they need some time to ponder it. When your child disobeys, he or she may need some time to think that through. Here's Ginger Hubbard on Focus on the Family Man. So ask them those questions, and then maybe have them go to their room and and take a little time to ponder what they did, what they should have done instead. And even with with lying, um, you want to have them come back and talk about what they should have done instead. And, you know, also we need to be willing to share our struggles. You know, all of us have lied at at one time or another. We all are going to struggle with that. And we need to be willing to humble ourselves and go to our kids and perhaps tell them about a time that we told a lie 
and what the consequences were and why it would have been so much better to be truthful in the first place. Mm. Even, if we, even if it was hard to be truthful, it is always the best thing to tell the truth. More parenting insights at familyminute.org. Amy Cabo and The Cure. We're back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Cabo and this is The Cure. You can listen to The Cure every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern on your radio or on our app, The Cure. On social media, all shows are available as a video podcast. Please check it out. Just look for The Cure. That's right, guys. Let's find a place where happiness begins and let's dance in the living room. Slave to the way you move. Live life. Don't forget to create happy moments. It's only human. We are joined by Chal- Shelly <laughs> talking about radical triumphs despite incredible trials. Shelly, we were talking about you growing up, discovering that you had siblings and um, one a very interesting one and also but then you at one point as when you were young you went to the Naval Academy and I I didn't think we got a chance to go into that I wanted to know what was your take on what occurred there since you have such an interesting point of view that you are such a forgiving person that you're such an understanding person that you realize that it's hurt people that hurt people i wanted to know what was the case with the naval academy so the naval academy was my ticket out of a small town in ohio my my aunt was a single mom there was no college fund. There was no money, you know, coming for, from anywhere. And nobody else had actually even gone to college. So I, um, I had heard about the Naval Academy and decided to apply. I had no idea how hard it was to get into. And I think that served me well because when you don't know what you can't accomplish, then you can accomplish it. <laughs> so I, uh, I applied. I went through the, uh, the rigorous application um, process. And I was accepted. So I thought I had made it. I survived my childhood, and I was now on to this incredible institution, going to get incredible education. Um, I really, truly believed, and this was my you know, 17, 18-year-old self, that, um, that I, I had made it. And I was now going to be in this safe place of integrity and l- learn to be educated and like how to sail and how to navigate by stars and um, and engineering. I mean, it's really considered one of the best institutions in the country. Right. And what I didn't realize at the time that I is that I really went from the frying pan into the to the fire. So my first year there, it's called your plebe year. Um, On a Saturday night, I was awoken from uh, a deep sleep by to this day I, I don't know if it was four or five guys that was that were in the room. Um, but I was gang raped. My roommates had been out of town on a swimming meet, so I was there by myself. And there were no locks on our doors because wow. they just didn't have them back then. It was it just wasn't thought of. So, um, so after it was over, I was sitting in the closet, which is my my place to go to to process terrible things. It always has been since I was a little girl. Sitting in the closet, I had an exacto blade to my knife, or a exacto knife to my wrist, and had taken a few marks because I just didn't know how to process what had just happened to me. I was traumatized. I I was feeling, and I know, Amy, I read your book, so I know you know the feeling of why does this keep happening to me? (laughs) Like, do I have some, like, why did this happen to 
me. Yes. And feeling like it was my fault or, you know, that's what I get for going to an all-military, you know, mostly man school. And um, so my roommates came home the next morning and found me in the closet. And I ended up having to go to the uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital. And at the time, because military academies were very rigorous, people trying to commit suicide was it was pretty regular. Like, it was something that happened. It didn't alarm too many people because they're like, it's just the stress. Wow. So they just saw it as I was, I, it, the stress had gotten to me. And at no point did anyone in the hospital, at the academy, ask if anything had happened to me. And I didn't, I didn't come forward and say that anything had happened to me. I had seen when other women had come forward that their characters would be assassinated. So, wow. yeah, so I was sitting in the hospital and thinking, all right, I have a couple of options here. Like, going back to Ohio was not an option. Like, I can quit, and then they win. You know, like, this is this was my education. This was my ticket out. And I just wasn't, like, I wasn't willing to allow them to to make me quit. So... My third option was, I'm going to stay, and even though I have to see these guys that did this to me, they have to see me too, and they're going to have to live with what they did as much as I have to live with it. And they were upperclassmen, so they were graduating the next year anyway. Um, So yeah, I think more than any other moment in my life, that that moment where I was like, I just not going to let them see that they broke me. Changed the the trajectory of my life, and I was, and but but you know, I say it. It was a strong moment then. I made it through. I white knuckled it through. Years later, you know, I had to actually do the therapy and talk about what happened. And Boris, to your comment earlier about you should come forward. I had a ton of guilt and shame around the fact that I didn't. No, but it wasn't um, your fault. No, no. I didn't, I yeah, didn't but, make it like, know, a, like, like an accusation. It years. Yeah, no. I know what you go through because I have read a lot about women that have gone through similar circumstances, especially in the military, and almost mm-hmm. none mm-hmm. has gone through saying something about it. But just recently, yeah. you see how it's happening. A lot of people are. Yeah, but you were explaining it better. Yeah, no, it's it's still, there's a culture of secrecy, it's still a good old boys culture, and it's, you know, it's don't come forward, they try to sweep it under the rug. I think it's gotten better at the academies, but the military, probably more than any other huge organization, has ridiculous incidences of sexual assault and sexual abuse. And it must have been hard for you to live with it and keep it to yourself and live with that secrecy the whole time that you were there until you graduated and you were able to get help. (laughs) It was truly awful. I think about that. I just told the story the other day to one of my Bloom members, and she's like, you know, how did you survive that? I'm like, I honestly don't know how I did it. I just did it. It was And and actually, I I will say... That's what I tell people. I had one belief that was, like, I had already gone through something like this. So I had spent all of my childhood... You know, when no didn't mean no, when my body was being disrespected and, you know, having no agency. So there was part of me that was like, I've been in this situation before, so I know I can make it through. Nice. And I did. But, you know, then I had to go back and and do some serious healing work and therapy and forgiving myself and forgiving them. and, And now it seems like a million years ago, thank God. Like, I used to think about it every day, and now I, I only tell the story to help other women. And, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't trigger me like it used to. Um, well, you basically good. turned your pain into purpose, and that's the best thing you Absolutely. can do. And that's the only way that you can win. And it's important to let other people know, because for you, you felt like it was a very difficult mm-hmm. position to even say anything. And, I mean, could you turn to a friend? Everyone was a guy. Uh, What are you going to do? And there are people that feel alone in the world and that are afraid and that are afraid to say anything or or for whatever reason. 
And I think that's what's beautiful yeah. about what you've created. That's a safe space for women because it's, it's, a, it's a place where we know that we can come to each other for anything. Absolutely. But it, 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 it is something that, that obviously has happened and it happens a lot. Uh, it's it's just not being talked about enough, and I think people like you, Shelley, I really do, that you're strong enough and that you can come forward and courageous enough that you can help others. Get Shelley, hey, one you. last thing, you. your exit question. If you can change one thing in the world, what would it be? <sighs> <laughs> I would, if I change it, I would, I, what I would want for the world is that every person to understand and lo love and accept themselves and then understand that we're all connected. So that is so true. The actions of you affect me, affect, you know, we all, all the actions, it's butterfly effect. We're all connected. So, um, so if you make decisions, and you live your life knowing that, you know, what you do affects the, the lives of the people around you. I just wonder how different the world would be. And I, I think there'd be a lot less war <laughs> or maybe be gone altogether. A lot less divisiveness, a lot less judgment, a lot less, you know, having to put people in categories. Um, Shelby, yeah. people like you are so needed. <laughs> I really admire your journey. And I, I guess that's the whole idea that I'm trying to put out there, that I believe the biggest reason that we are here is to be there for one another. Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Shelley, I'm for being with us. Me. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. For more information on Shelley Wolford, please go to GodIsTheCure.com and look under guests. Now, I talk to God all the time. I don't believe God speaks to us back. He just influences things, like my thoughts or ideas. The good ones are derived from Him, or the bad ideas and thoughts come from the enemy. It's one we have to make a choice. So here's a good prayer a friend sent me. When you wake up, say, Jesus, I love you. When leaving the house, say, Jesus, come with me. When you feel like crying, say, Jesus, hug me. When you feel happy, say, Jesus, I adore you. When you do something, say, Jesus, help me. When you make a mistake, say, Jesus, forgive me. When you go to sleep, say, thank you, Jesus, and cover me with your holy mantle. This is Amy Cabo. You have been listening to The Cure. Check out our podcast, Look for The Cure. Thank you for being with us, and until next week, much love. Thank you for listening to The Cure with Amy Cabo. For more information or to get Amy's book, Love is the Answer, God is the Cure, or to listen to the podcasts of previous shows, visit